I am Private Richard G. Perrin, serial number RA-11748246. I am a Rita. Uh, I joined the Army in January 1957 uh, because the, the draft was inevitable and I decided that it was best for uh, uh, choice rather than chance. Um, before I went in the Army, I had uh, but the only knowledge I had of the war in Vietnam was what I had heard on radio and television and read in newspapers. I took uh, basic training at Fort Gordon, Georgia. Uh, they kept us very busy there during basic and we didn't have any time for uh, ac actually thinking about uh, what the war was all about. Uh, just the military aspects of it. I took uh, my first advanced individual training at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. It was here that uh, I began to seriously question the validity of the war. Uh, started out, I read a, uh, a book review uh, of Senator Fulbright's uh, Arrogance of Power, which impressed me. Uh, then one Sunday, I was sitting in a PX cafeteria and I overheard some Vietnam veterans describing how they had tortured, uh, captured members of the NLF. I, uh, shortly after this time, I went home for one week on leave and uh, just told my parents that if I was sent to Vietnam, I was going against my will and that if I were to die in Vietnam that I was going to be dying for something that I did not believe in. Uh, I spent the second week of my two-week leave with my brother in California and told him that uh, I wanted some uh, reading material concerning the, the war uh, so that I could judge for myself whether uh, I could justify going to Vietnam and uh, fighting against these people. Uh, after that, I went to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma for my second advanced individual training in track vehicle mechanics, which deals with self-propelled artillery and uh, tanks. I was there for just a few days when I found out that there had been an anti-war movement at the fort before my arrival. I went out and I found Andy Stapp, the leader of the anti this movement, and uh, he uh, provided me with a library of literature, and I proceeded to go see him every night after duty hours, and we discussed the war, and I met other members of the movement. Uh, we talked to other GIs there at the fort, um, gave them literature, asked them what they thought of what was happening, and uh, in a few cases, uh, we got written statements uh, by these GIs denouncing the war, and uh, some t in, in other cases, we just uh, got numbers. They uh, didn't want to become public. Uh, about two weeks after this started, Marianne Wiseman and Key Martin from uh, Youth Against War and Fascism Committee for GI Rights in New York City came, and uh, we started a Oh, a, a very large movement uh, headquartered at the uh, Holiday Inn in downtown Lawton, Oklahoma. Uh, we were going down there uh, every night. It was, well, it was five of us going down there every night and discussing the war with Marianne and Key and uh, writing uh, articles, writing letters of support to Fort Hood Three, uh, Howard Petrick, Captain Levy, and uh, at, at this time, I, I sent an uh, article to the National Guardian in New York that was published in the Opinions column and I believe it was July 15th. Uh, two days after this, 
After leaving the motel, uh, we were picked up by civilian detectives for uh, making an illegal left-hand turn in one of the fellow's cars. And uh, I didn't have a pass with me, so they arrested us, arrested me and another friend of mine who also didn't have a pass, and sent us, turned us over to the military authorities. Uh, I was informed that uh, I was to be on administrative restriction, which is a restriction to the barracks and 50 feet around it, and that uh, I was to be given non-judicial punishment in the form of an Article 15. I refused an Article 15 for the purpose of uh, the Army proving my guilt, and uh, before a date was set, uh, I was uh, charged with breaking the restriction of 50 feet around the barracks twice. Uh, Mary Ann and Key came on to the fort. I couldn't go to the motel, so they came on the fort to see me. And we went about 100 feet beyond the 50-foot uh, area around the barracks. And uh, we were being watched. And I was, had another charge with two specifications filed against me. Uh, also, during this time, Andy Stapp was charged with breaking a restriction. Uh, there wasn't any restriction, and it was proved in his court-martial that uh, the charges were groundless. On July 31st, Andy and I were both court-martialed, Andy in the morning and myself in the afternoon. Uh, Andy's, all of Andy's charges and specifications were dropped because of uh, groundless evidence, and uh, I was found guilty of all charges and specifications and sentenced to 30 days of hard labor and reduction to the lowest pay grade. Uh, I was in the stockade at Fort Sill, Oklahoma for 15 days. During this time, uh, chaplains and officers uh, came to talk with me and they supplied me with uh, pro-war literature. Um, after 15 days, uh, my com commanding officer came to visit me, and he asked me if uh, I had orders to go to Vietnam, what would I do? And I said I'd go to Vietnam, and I'd look and see for myself uh, whether the war was uh, just or not. So he said, okay, you have orders to go to Europe. Uh, I was released 15 days before my sentence was finished, and uh, sent to Fort Dix, New Jersey at the Overseas Replacement Station. Um, also, uh, I was released 15 days early uh, because I, uh, on the condition that I wouldn't speak to Andy Stapp again and that I wouldn't have any contact with New York uh, Youth Against War and Fascism people. Um, I only, I got a chance to see Andy for about an hour before I left Fort Sill. And when I was at Fort, Fort Dix, New Jersey, the uh, three carloads of people from uh, YAWF came down to see me just before I left for Europe. After this, I, uh, I, I cannot tell you where I was stationed or what I have been doing since because it uh, might incriminate some of my, the people that I am helping. Can we ask questions now? Uh, I'm like you. Uh, are you present? Wait a minute. Just wait a minute. Maybe I'd just like to talk to you a little about the war in Vietnam. Okay. Because as you know, we're very interested in the war in Vietnam, and many young people in the United States are against the war. And I'd just like to know about your own feelings, how you grew up, and what made you finally take the decision not to go to the war in Vietnam. If you don't mind, you can just tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, I was... Uh, 
born in uh, Massachusetts and uh, shortly afterwards moved to Vermont where I lived until I graduated from high school in June 1966. Uh, my parents uh, are, uh, are not uh, political people. Um, they feel that uh, the Democrat, because of the because of the uh, We're saying we'd just like to know a little about your life so that we can see. Would you repeat that question, please? We're saying we'd like to see a little bit about your life so that we can begin to understand what led you to your decision. Um, up until the time, uh, uh, probably the last year of my high school, uh, I uh, hadn't become, in, uh, wasn't a, in, at all interested in uh, political uh, situations, um, the uh, racist uh, situation in the states, until uh, I went to Chicago in, I believe it was 1964, 65, when Martin Luther King started his, uh, his uh, equal housing uh, pr program in Chicago. We, and I marched with uh, Martin Luther King and Dick Gregory from uh, Buckingham Fountain to the City Hall. Uh, it was at this time that I uh, began to uh, think in terms of uh, uh, maybe everything that I, ha that I have been told in school and uh, by the educators in the school system there. Uh, maybe all of this uh, isn't, e isn't exactly all as the way it is. Um, so, uh, in school, I, uh, when uh, the United States was involved with the uh, Santa Domingo situation, I, um, I was not too well informed about it, but uh, I was disenchanted with the whole uh, intervention of the United States in Santa Domingo. And it seemed that uh, everywhere in the world, the United States was becoming involved in things that uh, seemed to me should be left up to the people that uh, it was directly that were directly involved with these uh, problems. Um, and then, when I was a senior, I uh, became very friendly with a minister, Baptist minister in my hometown, who had been to Selma, Alabama, and. Uh, Mississippi, done uh, work in the freedom schools down there. And um, this influenced the, uh, the direction of where I am right now tremendously. White A white minister, yes. In Springfield, Vermont? Springfield, Vermont. <laughs> um, so uh, on what is called Youth Sunday, I gave a speech or a sermon. Uh, uh, concerning the uh, uh, the problem with the blacks and the whites in, in the United States. And uh, shortly afterwards, I graduated from high school and moved to California uh, to live with my brother, who is a uh, graduate student in philosophy at the uh, University of California, San Diego. Um, there I went to uh, one anti-war meeting. Um, I saw the film Time of the Locust and heard the, a tape recording of Bertrand Russell's appeal to the American conscience. Um, after uh, hearing this uh, tape and seeing the movie and uh, listening to people uh, who had been in Vietnam, veterans of the Marine Corps and in the Navy who uh, lived around near San Diego, uh, 
I became, uh, you know, I realized that uh, some of the actions uh, of the United States military in uh, Vietnam weren't exactly uh, what you'd call uh, in the best humanitarian interest. Um, but I still didn't, I, had, I didn't know whether the uh, U.S. involvement in the war as, uh, was, was uh, just. Uh, I just uh, was aware of the fact that some of the things that were happening there were, were pretty bad. And uh, in j January, I uh, broke up with my girlfriend and it became increasingly harder to get a job because uh, I had fulfilled my uh, military obligation and I'd go and apply for a job and the first thing they'd say was, what is your draft status? And that would just end the whole thing right there, no job. So uh, I went back to Vermont for two weeks to see my folks and uh, I was walking down the street one day and I walked into the Army recruiting office I hadn't been thinking of it before. I walked in, and when I walked out, I was in the United States Army, and I left for Fort Gordon the next day. Um, it was kind of a, a fast thing. It, I, I didn't do any thinking about it before I did it, and it was a, um, a very poor move, to say the least. Uh, All right. Let's go back a little. All right to um, your beginning statement, uh, for example, concerning the detectives. Mm -hmm. I was very interested in that. Why do you think the plainclothes detectives would stop you? Um, Mary Ann Wiseman and Key Martin were, are, uh, well, communists from uh, YWF, and they were being watched by federal, local authorities, civilian and military. And uh, they saw that I was going down there every night and uh, I was becoming more and more militant, making uh, statements before the press. And I would imagine they just wanted me to, wanted to uh, get me out of the way because they, uh, the detectives uh, testified at my court martial that they picked us up because we made an illegal left-hand turn. But uh, when I left uh, Fort Sill, I went by the place where they picked us up and there's no sign that says you can't make a left-hand turn there. Um, they just, uh, it was, I would imagine it was probably all prearranged. How was your and, treatment? Um, they'd, um, well, it was, actually it was, I thought it was ridiculous because they were treating us as if we were some murderers or something. They handcuffed us behind the back, frisked, frisked, uh, <coughs> frisked us. Uh, For making a left-hand turn? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And um, hauled us off to jail, made sure we didn't have any sharp objects so that we wouldn't uh, commit suicide or something. It was, it was all very ridiculous. Then they uh, turned us over to the military police, took us back to the fort, and uh, released us to our uh, units. And uh, we didn't hear anything. We, we were just told that we were on restriction. We, we never heard a thing for, oh, probably five days, so I went into the uh, office of the commanding officer and I asked him if uh, he was going to do anything. And he said, well, you've kind of put me on the spot. He said, I'll have papers written up tomorrow. So I, I don't know what they were planning on doing, but they didn't do anything up until the time I asked them if they were going to take legal action against me. Now, the other thing you said was a turning point when you heard two uh, Vietnamese veterans talking about torture. Precisely what did they say? Um, they were uh, tankers. Um, they had uh, two members of the NLF, and uh, they, they had the tank and the, the engines of the tank running. And uh, being a tank mechanic, I can tell you that a tank gets very hot after the engine's been running for a while. They took uh, and tied, uh, they described uh, tying uh, some sort of string or rope around the testicles of the, uh, um, the two uh, prisoners and um, 
pushing them up, forcing their testicles up against the side of the tank, um, asking questions concerning uh, military intelligence. And it, every time they refused to answer, they'd push them up against the tank. And uh, uh, I'd say that a tank was hot enough to cook an egg after the, when the engine was running. They, they stated that the engine was running. How did they seem to feel about this? Oh, they were sitting, they were laughing and joking about it. Um, I had heard things like that before, but it never, it uh, didn't hit me as, as hard as this because these guys seem to talk as if uh, they enjoyed doing it. Um, you know, they were dirty, rotten reds, and uh, what difference did it make anyway? Uh, seemed to discount the fact that they were human beings, and uh, it just made me sick. Uh, this is uh, just one one instance. I, I heard uh, numerous stories by guys that had heard stories uh, from guys coming back from Vietnam, and I heard uh, firsthand uh, accounts of the tortures in Vietnam. And the other thing is about the army in general. How do most of the young men in the army feel about the question of Vietnam and especially of black uh, soldiers? Well, uh, at Fort Sill, I would uh, I'd let the other guys in my unit know that I had this literature and uh, left it out. And at first, they wouldn't touch it. They uh, just uh, they said they didn't want anything to do with communist propaganda. Uh, this this literature was uh, there was quite a bit of uh, Quaker literature, um, literature from uh, student democrat students democratic society, um, young socialist pamphlets, um, any 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 kind of literature that we could get our hands on. talking about the attitude of most of the soldiers on the basis, especially the black soldiers. Mm. Um, all the time I was in the Army, uh, I only had contact with, close contact with two, two black soldiers. Uh, one was at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. He was uh, involved with the uh, Poder à la Troisième bobine. Mm -hmm. You were just talking about the attitude of soldiers in the army, especially black soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have very much contact with uh, black soldiers when I was in the army because I was in uh, a specialized training. Um, track vehicle mechanics. Uh, and you'll find in the army that most of the black are in the infantry to go out and do all the dirty work. Um, I did have contact with two black soldiers. Uh, one when I was in basic and one in uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. The one in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri had been uh, active in the resistance around San Francisco, black resistance. Uh, and uh, I spent a lot of time with him. Uh, he was the only, only black soldier in our unit there at uh, Fort Leonard Wood. And the other soldier at, in basic was the only black soldier in our unit there. And uh, I spent time with, uh, especially the one at Fort Leonard Wood because uh, he was very active and interested in the same things that I was becoming uh, more and more involved in. All as time went along. Uh, uh, when I was at the in the stockade at Fort Sill, I had a, an Afro guard uh, who uh, was in the artillery in Vietnam and who had been hit by uh, mortar shrapnel, and, uh, which had uh, ripped one of his legs apart and gone into his side. And, uh, I asked him uh, 
what he thought of the war in Vietnam. He said that uh, he didn't have uh, any political opinions concerning the war, but he did say that if he had orders to go back, he'd refuse to go. Um, the white soldiers uh, that I had uh, contact with in the Army um, were reluctant at first to even have anything to do with uh, this literature and uh, the things that we were talking about. But after a while, they became more and more interested in it. And quite a few expressed uh, their opinions opposing the war. And, uh, but that they, uh, they didn't want to uh, become public because all they were concerned with was getting their military obligation over with and going back to their own private life and uh, leave, the, uh, leave the war to the war makers. Is there any strong resistance movement to the war developing? Yes, and uh, at Fort Sill, uh, especially, uh, also at Fort Hood, Texas, where recently, within the last two or three months, there was a revolt by a whole unit that was uh, uh, scheduled to leave for Vietnam. Uh, they went uh, running all over the fort, uh, beating up officers and uh, just generally revolting against the uh, whole military establishment. Um, there's also anti-war movements within the Army in uh, Fort Dix that I know of at uh, um, Fort Ord, California, Fort Lewis, Washington. And we also have uh, contact with a number of soldiers in Vietnam. And then, uh, of course, there's uh, a, a growing uh, anti-war faction within the European uh, military, US military. I guess we're open for questions now. You have to stop and sit on the door. No. You have to go to, to the door and, yeah, and walk right in oh. and take what you in the same place as you can. Yeah. Could you turn yeah. my mic a little bit yeah. more this way, please? That's right. And, uh, okay. Now, I'll ask you the, the question and then you step into... I'll tell you what you can Private Karen, how great is this resistance movement among the GIs in Europe? Well, maybe maybe uh, I can partly answer this question. Uh, I am from uh, Holland, and uh, we in Holland.